Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Death By, where contestants will earn reps for their arguments for a chance to stand on top of the podium pedestal. I am your host, Lauren Khalil. Whoever I decide has the best argument through the final round will earn 30 seconds to talk about a topic of their choosing. Before we get into today's episode, we want to thank our sponsor, Thirdsy. If you want to sleep like you're dead, but actually not be dead, you got to take your Thirdsy because I slept a record. I set a PR for myself 14 and a half hours sleeping. I took my Thirdsy around 5 p.m. and I said, lights out. I need to reboot from all of the travel at semifinals, get my Thirdsy in, and then sleep with no alarm. I did not wake up once, people. This stuff is the real deal. If you want to get good sleep, it also has collagen, magnesium, GABA, L-theanine, all inside one delicious strawberry lemonade beverage before bedtime. It's not habit forming, so you can take it every single night and just make it part of your routine. Now, if you want to improve your sleep, you can use the code DEATHBY, save 20% on all your purchases at thirdsy.com. That's T H I R. DZY.com. You can sleep like you're dead without being dead today. But on today's episode, we have two time affiliate cup champion and seminar staff head trainer James Hobart, CrossFit Games athlete Tim Paulson, and Kenny Johnson. KJ is coming back. He also helped bring CrossFit team Invictus to victory this past weekend. Got his shirt ready. Welcome to the show and congratulations. How's everybody feeling? We're we're almost to the third and final week of semifinals. Awesome. Bring on the final week. Bring on the final week and one more flight. <laughs> One more flight. We can do it. Take your thirdsy. You'll be able to do it better, KJ. I promise you. <laughs> I need to be able to be awake for the next four days. Then uh, I will get deep into those 14 hours of sleep. Okay. We're almost there. One more week. Three semifinals left. Let's get into topic number one. Let's play death by. Two weeks down, nothing has compared to attendance that we saw in Europe in week one. The seats in Carson, they were nearly empty. And although Tori and Pro, we do want to give them credit because they had way more fans there. It still wasn't the amount that we were used to seeing in attendance from previous years. So how do events, how does CrossFit, really anybody, increase the attendance at live events? Let's start this round with James Hobart. Oh boy. Well, last time I talked about attendance, it, uh, people didn't love it. So, um, I, you know, I, I will say this, I think I watched more of that semifinal than I have of a lot of the others. And uh, part of it was just the nostalgia of seeing the Carson stadium again. Um, I think there were some things, some challenges set up from the start. One is, I think you have the reference of the games being there last time. And that is like, was always such a packed event in that stadium. You have that in your mind. So comparing it to that is challenging. But I also think, I just wonder if the the size of the stadium was too big. I wonder if it's Memorial Day weekend. Um, does it matter that the stadium is completely outside? So I, I wonder if all those things factored in. Also, um, you know, historically, and I'm, I'm CrossFit old, but I do remember, I feel like some of the Northeast regionals were held around uh, Memorial Day weekend. I remember those being packed, but I think part of that has to do with just the size of the region, getting there, traveling, um, lodging, staying there. A lot of the gyms and states are smaller, or not gyms smaller, but states are smaller, easier to travel, whereas in the West Coast, uh, much greater distances to travel. So I think all of those things played into um, making it a challenge to to get people in there. How do you increase it? I don't know. I think you do have maybe a slightly smaller stadium. You get it away from the holiday weekend, and you try and have it in a place that's more centrally located to, I don't know, maybe you throw a dart, dart and look at how many affiliates are really, really close to this one city, regardless if it's a huge city or a smaller city. But um, those would be some things I'd look at. Um, it was a super bummer, like I said, to not see more people there just because it was an awesome event. So maybe blame it on the holiday. <laughs> Maybe blame it on the holiday. I like what you said about looking at <laughs> locations with that are that are affiliate dense. Three points for you. I'm going to circle back to that after. But first, let's go to KJ. Well, first, even as a Canadian, I'm not going to blame America for 
a holiday, you know, I'm just going to say that right out there and put that out there. Um, no, I think it definitely is a valid point. Um, you know, travel and holidays and the weather getting better. People are outside trying to get stuff done. But um, one of the things I think that led into the issue that we had with most of the semifinals this year dates all the way back to the open quarterfinals and the narrative that kind of got set up before. And then, you know, we had all the debacle with the scoring. We had uh, some of our athletes falling out of contention. Then we had the announcement that there wasn't really going to be a lot of live coverage. You know, it just didn't really set the tone, I think, for people to be excited about this period of the season as we have in the past. The narrative and the communication per usual, it has been a little bit more um, somber and depressive instead of like, hey, look how cool and exciting outside of, I think, the really cool thing that we had, which was going back to Carson. Um, and so I think the disappointment feels really big because that was supposed to probably be a, a big linchpin for coming back to the, the OG stadium. But the community sentiment, I think, going into semifinals was probably a little bit dampered just based on how everything else has played out. Um, and then if we have a new place for the CrossFit Games, that sold out immediately. We already know people are going to go and maybe they're just not that interested in this phase. They feel like they're going to get to go and see people who are going to uh, compete for the biggest prize. And this isn't as important to them. I think that's a piece of it. But so how do we increase attendance? I think we see it really well with things like Guadalupe. I've been over to Europe to see the semifinal there. I think we're going to see better attendance this uh, next weekend in Knoxville because they have a community event. They're bringing in athletes that then not only are spending the money to travel for themselves, they get to do something and then get to be there in the stadium to cheer on their, um, you know, idols. We get to see Tia, we get to see some of the bigger athletes in this one and wrapping the community into it. I think it's also just an easier way to make some money for the competition. Syndicate has been awesome. It's been run incredibly well. Those guys know what they're doing long, all the way back to the sanctional days. Like they kind of sent the, precedent for how this should be done. So I'm looking at them with the idea of like they're involving the community. I guarantee you they will have things already set up to make that environment better and more exciting for the fans that are there. Um, but I think the biggest piece is let's add a community event to do it, get those people who want to come and exercise and also cheer it on. Mm, adding a community event like that. Three points for KJ. Tim, what's your take? Well, he took one of my biggest points right at the end there. I think the community, wrapping a community event into it is definitely a really good way to go about this. Torian did that. Um, but I guess for me, I mean, a couple of things really stand out. The biggest one is that because there's like this one marquee event in Europe now, there's this one marquee event in Australia, there's not going to be much split or kind of divide. And I feel like the U.S. is maybe a little bit different because we're so used to having multiple semifinals or regionals scattered all around the country that they feel hyper local. So there's a lot of travel. You know, I remember like James was alluding to burning our hands back in 2012 or 13, whatever it was outside at Reebok headquarters. You know, like, like those smaller regional events were always packed. And I understand why they're not feasible from an administration standpoint to have six regionals across all of North America. But I think when you only have two, you're going to isolate a lot of people because those local CrossFit communities, like James was saying earlier, you have to be really smart about where you pick them because you're you're basically hyper relying on the local community. Those are the people that come out to support semifinals and regionals. A lot of people, if they're going to travel to watch CrossFit, they're going to travel to watch the games. They're not going to travel halfway across the country to watch a semifinal event. So I think you really need to be able to lean into the local communities, whether it's affiliate density or whether it's just like a, a strong track record for having another event in the area that does really well. You look at like Granite Games or Wattapalooza, stuff like that. So I think those might be better factors to like help make these events feel more local. Because again, I just don't think people are going to travel twice. You know, they're going to, the people that are really committed to the sport that are excited about it, they're not going to travel for semifinals and six weeks later, eight weeks later, whatever, go travel for the games as well. So you need to really tap into those local markets and figure out what they, you know, what they look like and how to best maximize them, I think. Hmm. Two points for Tim. Going back to what, whoa, were you surprised that he only got two points, James? I, just, I, I felt like that was at least a three, but you know how I am with the points, so ignore me. I know. <laughs> you're you're the backup point distributor, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> going going back to James's point about finding locations that are affiliate dense, you know, we look at these big cities like Carson that's right outside of LA and we think that is a destination. That's how we're going to get people to pay and go there. But is it in fact better to host 
these live competitions in smaller cities that might have a bigger local turnout. And I think Green Bay, Wisconsin could be a great location. When I lived there, there were like five to six affiliates just within a five to 10 mile radius. And uh, I don't know, what are, what are your takes on smaller versus bigger city for these things? I, I think we're really overestimating people's desire to want to go to LA. Like I, <laughs> you, if you gave me a list of places Airport to go, is terrible, if anybody's wondering, I mean, yeah, sit on LA traffic, LA debt. Like there, there are not a lot of reasons for me to want to go to LA. Um, so I think anyway, so I, I don't think of it as like a, a hot spot other than purely the, the, the CrossFit historical nerd in me, which yes, like tennis stadium, hundred percent, but as like a, I want to go to LA or Southern California. Like I, no, I'm, I'm good. I'd rather go somewhere else, but that's also a personal bias. But I do think that like, you know, moderate sized cities are probably going to be you know, better served. Like pick cities that have, you know, 15 or 20 affiliates. They're not these massive sprawling New York City, LA, stuff like that. But, you know, they have a good affiliate base. They have a strong base of CrossFit and it's, you know, it's well known. And again, you toss a community event on top of that, you're going to get a lot of, you know, probably buy-in from those affiliates to come to the event. So yeah, I I think smaller cities probably going to be better. And again, um, you know, I don't think you really need to go all the way out West because you're again, you're isolating a lot of those center you know, center of the country folks where you're still giving them a three, four hour flight. It's more expensive, you know, versus like make, make the Californians travel in a little bit, make it a little bit more central to that region, to the West region. Yeah. And I would echo this, the cost, um, you know, if you can make it as affordable as possible, people are more likely to go, which means if they can drive, if the hotels are cheaper, if the food is cheaper, if, you know, you're not sitting in nine hours of traffic each direction. I think that all makes a difference for some of these people to make that plan. Um, the other one I would honestly say is like, let's make the tickets $25 a day or even less. Like I know we're trying to make money to put these things on, but like a full stadium of $20 tickets is a lot better than like 15 people at $110 a ticket or whatever they charge this year, year like $70 after fees you know, get people incentivized to actually come instead of just sitting at home and watching it afterwards. At what point do we look at what CrossFit is doing and promoting it? I think how cool would it be if there was a poster, a CrossFit poster in every single affiliate that had the layout of dates and in-person competition? Do you think that the promotion inside the affiliate could get more people to attend? I definitely think that could help. And I like that idea a lot. I think there's a lot of question marks and that's why we're having this conversation around like, how do we drive this forward most effectively? And like, what are the best ways to continue to grow not only athlete participation, but also spectator participation engagement in the sport of CrossFit. Um, you know, I, there is this part of me that wonders, like I look at the numbers in the open and they have gone up significantly since they were at their lowest, but also like has the live sport of CrossFit recovered um, from a pre COVID era, right? We had this meteoric rise of growth in CrossFit, which was a lot of things happening at the same time. COVID hit, um, huge change of leadership in CrossFit, um, get some continued change of leadership in CrossFit. And I think all of those and other things to have affected maybe the live partis live, uh, participant engagement in the sport. And I think there are probably some questions of like, maybe do we kind of take this approach of rather than hoping for like this huge rise in growth again, and instead of having to take drastic measures, it's a little bit of like, hey, we're gonna have smaller steps of growth. We are gonna run maybe slightly smaller competitions, um, more central, not centrally, yeah, more centrally located, slightly smaller cities where it's not just, hey, this event is awesome. The Subhub Center at Carson is amazing. Is it still called that? Probably not. Um, the Carson Stadium is amazing, but what always felt really cool to me about somewhere like Madison was like, not only did you feel you immersed in CrossFit in the event when you're in the stadium, but you go into the city and that you felt like you were still rolled up in the event there. Maybe LA is just too darn big for that. And we need to, you know, another reason to go to those smaller cities. So I wonder if the approach is a little bit of modest growth um, in the short term to kind of like get that live event engagement back again. I think we really felt that in Vegas. Um there's so many things going on there that like, and literally everybody feels this when they go to Vegas, you could have the largest convention for dentistry that has ever taken place. And you have no idea it's happening other than you see a bunch of dentists, maybe walking around your casino. Like 
you can't put our sport in a place where it gets swallowed up really fast. It's still pretty small and pretty tight and giving Madison loved CrossFit, like maybe going back there might actually be a, a good answer in the future because you do need somebody who's going to embrace it and push it forward. But ultimately, um, you know, the local area for these smaller pieces of the puzzle, I think are going to be it and building a better, stronger narrative to encourage people and knowing, uh, that they care that the capital C CrossFit is putting the energy and effort into it is also a big piece of it. And I think the less that we feel comfortable that they're doing that, it trickles down to the fans. Yeah. I think I like that last point as well, because like we talked about this two shows ago, four, I don't know, relatively recently about the split between CrossFit, the methodology slash affiliates, and then CrossFit, the sport. And like, you know, just is CrossFit, the sport getting the resources that it needs? Is it, does it have, the big enough, dedicated enough team that it needs to do some market research, to figure out and have, you know, strategy discussions around how to best optimize these semifinal events. Like we don't know, but it feels like a more dedicated team whose life solely revolves around growing the sport, growing semifinals, getting engagement, storytelling throughout the entire season. It just feels like that could help a lot. And that goes back to like creating a good vibe within the community and the athletes and spectators at these events feeling like, you know, capital C CrossFit or spin-off CrossFit, whatever, is fully invested in this and they really want to see it succeed rather than kind of wondering wondering if they do at points, which I think would be a fair, a fair assessment of the community's take on whether CrossFit really loves the sport and wants to see it grow or if they're kind of ambivalent to it at times. Let's now move on to Topic number two, we're going to get athlete specific. I know there's so many amazing athletes we could talk about, but here we are focusing on Justin Medeiros. Some people have doubted him since finishing 13th at the CrossFit Games last year after being the fittest man on earth back to back years in 2021 and 2022. But Medeiros at semifinals, he goes seventh, third, third, eighth, fifth, and second to give him the overall win at the West Coast Classic. But was this enough to show you, the fans, the the analysts of the sport, that he is, in fact, back? KJ, we'll start round number two with you. Yeah, this one touches close to home as a CrossFit Fort Vancouver before I went out east. Um, it's always hard to say, like, is somebody back? Were they ever gone with such a short uh, time frame in between? And here's what I know about Justin. And if you go and watch any of the tape, and here's what I know about Adam. No one in our sport paces and knows their own fitness better. There were some things that happened early in the CrossFit Games last year that put Justin in a hole. And you just read off what he did, short of a second place finish in there and a third. Like, that's not his game. He is... Mr. Consistent, Mr. Pick off two or three people in the last couple reps of each individual workout. You saw it in the very final, just edging out some people on that lunge. This guy knows himself and his fitness. Now, that doesn't mean he's fitter than some of the other people that are going to show up in Texas here in a couple of weeks. But I trust no one more to show up prepared to execute and do their best and not leave any points on the table, as he's known to say, to die for points than Justin Medeiros. I know for a fact that he will be in the conversation this year, as long as he doesn't have something that, you know, turns up, fell twice on the bike in the very first event and went a little bit different. And he's just not built to catch up. There's, you know, March Madness teams that are built to lead. There's March Madness teams that once they fall behind, they're not catching up. And I think Justin is built to be on that average across the board. And he just fell a little bit too far behind early and just isn't built to hit home runs to offset those. So to say if he's back, I don't think he was ever gone. Um, does that mean he's going to stand on the top of the podium? I don't know, but I guarantee you you're going to see a different Justin uh, and a different narrative written about him at the end of the season. Four points for KJ, Tim. Yeah, I mean, look, the dude won. It's hard. It's hard to argue against the field that he beat, too. You know, like at the end of the day, he beat Fakowski, Velno. Like he beat guys that are perennially on the podium in the top five. So it's a short event, you know. So I think you have guys like Velner who, you know, like I think anybody who watched the Snatch Ladder during West Coast Classic was just kind of like rubbing their head, like, ah, oh, damn it, Pat. Um, you know, just cause like he had one rough event, like, you know, the snatch ladder, whatever was happening at the end there had a bunch of misses, but up until that point, I mean, 
it looked like I thought that Velner was going to run, uh, not run away, but I thought he was going to win the weekend. And I think that event with Stan, notwithstanding, he probably would have been very close to Justin on points, if not having beaten him. So, you know, you can't predict the future. I think Justin made a really strong statement to show that, again, he is Mr. Consistency. He's back on the top of the leaderboard. He's running with the best. He's not missing a beat. Um, but at the end of the day, the games are a very different beast. And Fakowski also looked great at semifinals, super consistent across the board. Velner, same thing, barring his one little snafu in the snatch event. You know, he was – he and, like, Velner is someone who does hit home runs. You know, he'll go out at the games and he'll win a couple of events or he'll come really close to the top in a few, you know, as he kind of seems to be his MO to make up for whatever little – whatever little Velner blunder happens. Um, but, yeah, so I think Justin made a good statement here this weekend, but I agree completely that it's not a – he did not show that he's the one-man race for the top of the podium this year by any stretch. Three points for Tim, but before we move on, this is a uh, – somebody is about to abduct your two kids and your wife. Do you pick Velner or Justin to stand on top of the podium? I'm going to go with old Patty Velner. I would I would put Pat Velner higher – if not on top of the podium, higher than Justin this year at the games. Okay. He's aging like s- fine wine. He, he's moving <laughs> back across the country to be with his family. He's going to be in like a better family situation, you know, when all is kind of said and done. So I'd put some, I'd put some heavy, heavy eggs in the Pat Valander basket at the games this year. Okay, perfect. We're going to clip this and we're going to save it until after Texas. <laughs> moving now on to James Hobart. What are your thoughts here? Oh man. Um, I kind of agree with both guys a little bit. I'm going to fence it um, as I am usually, as I usually do. I think, I don't think he ever left. Um, I think we're just pretty spoiled when it comes to champs, right? You're looking at, you know, the Tias, the Katrins, um, the, you know, the Annies, the Frasers, um, Froning, <laughs> you know, you see these athletes who have just sh- continually showed up on the podium. Um, Justin had, had two wins then had a 13th. Um, I think he's still got an amazing career ahead of him. So I think that's one thing. I don't think he ever went anywhere. I don't think he is a shoe in, um, to, be on the podium or win the games this year. And the only reason I say that is I think at this semifinal, he beat two of the other athletes who beat him at the games last year. I think most of those other athletes are in other regions. I'm a little bit reluctant to do a cross regional comparison. And that just has to do with um, just being, you know, outdoors versus indoors. People might say it doesn't matter a lot. I think it does. It looks like he's beating at this semifinal, second and third place by similar point amounts to some of the other semifinal winners. So I think he's like on par in terms of fitness, but we still have to see the East region go as far as saying like, wow, not only is Justin, you know, hitting his stride again, but he's a clear, you know, shoe in for the podium. So I think those things still have to happen. Um, but I don't think he went anywhere at all. You know, he's still super fit. Um, and it's just easy for us because we're so spoiled with repeat champions to, I think, discount somebody having um, a misstep in a year, especially because those top 15, top 10 athletes of the games are so damn good. So it's hard to say he was like way off. Two points for James. If you were all to place him on the game's leaderboard today, what is the spot you would give him? Third? Fourth? Well, I said he wasn't a shoe-in for the podium, but I, yeah, third. Damn. Peer pressure. (laughs) Peer pressure broke me. You can change your mind. You don't need to put him on the podium. Uh, Nobody's coming to abduct you and your family. (laughs) Somebody might be. Just him. (laughs) Third. Let's, Tim, I think you're muted. Did you say something? I know. I just realized that. I said just mine. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, just just yours. But I would bet that if somebody was going to do that, that they would not get very far. I can see you letting your hair down and just going totally cray cray. Can you imagine being the guy who kicked in Tim's door one night? No. And you woke, you know, here he is, hasn't had sleep in a week. He's already just angry. He's got a pile of laundry he still has to do behind him. You know, can you imagine waking that guy up? He just tears your arms right off your body and beats you to death with him. It is folded. I have noticed that. Our- Good job. Our house is in the middle of nowhere and well defended. Good luck, anybody. Yeah, I have no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on now. Topic number three. We're going to swing to the other end of the spectrum. Colton, let me start over. Colton Mertens, if you know, you know, and Olivia Kerstetter, they won't return, even though they both had two first place finishes, but 
they did both have three bottom half finishes. So this is a question I got from a viewer today. Should an event win be worth more than 100 points? We will start the third and final round before we do have a bonus round today with Tim Polson. Um, I say no. I mean, first off, like I'm gutted for both Olivia and Colton. Like they looked so good this weekend and to see them not make it, you're like, damn it, man. Um, but no, I think, I don't think we need to award more than hundred points because, you know, it, our sport is about consistency. It's about being well-rounded. And I think that goes to a, a greater philosophical conversation about the sport of CrossFit is like, do we want to reward athletes who can hit home runs or do we want to reward athletes who are more consistent and what does the points table look like because of that um you know I, so i don't think more than 100 points would be necessary i think the big thing we'd be talking about is like do we change the spread like do we go to z scoring so that if you do dominate the field then you get a bigger reward over the person in second or do we possibly adjust the points uh points drop down from first to fifth or first to third what does that table look like I think those are the adjustments that, you know, the scoring team and like the community or the competitive community needs to have, because again, it's kind of looking at how do we want to reward people who perform at the games, you know, especially when we get into those 13 event weekends, you know, it's impressive. And like a lot of these events, you saw very consistent scoring among like the top five, there wasn't a whole lot of gaps, but if somebody does blow the blow second place out of the water, I would be a firm believer that they should get a bigger point spread for that. Because you're showing that, you know, we don't necessarily want to reward a specialist, but like if you are that much better than the field at this one thing, when we are so competitive across the board in pretty much every event now and the margins are so small, I could see more of an argument for that being rewarded, not just winning. I think just winning an event, you shouldn't get more points for it, but for blowing everybody out of the water and making them look a little silly, then maybe we need to have a conversation about you being rewarded for that. I can't remember. Are you pro- Z scoring, especially as an athlete. Uh, as long as it was done well and like it was very clear how it would work, I'm not a mathematician or anything, so I don't know how possible that would be. But I would be a proponent for it because I think again it more accurately reflects how the field stacks up against each other, especially when we're talking about you know you'll see ties on the leaderboard or like you'll see eight people within three seconds of each other. Like, I think there should be a little more difference there because you're so close to one another, but the point drops can still be so significant. So yeah, I, I would say I'm a proponent for Z scoring if we could figure out how to do it effectively, but I don't know how realistic that is. Four points for Tim. James? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> I think they should just get more money. I think sponsors should just give out money for event Ooh. wins like you know if a sponsor sponsors an event and colton snatches 265 for a double to win it like just makes that as a, as a game time decision um i think you should you know that should get paid out i don't think you should give them you know for all the reasons tim listed more points because you're rewarding perhaps in some cases a specialist and i actually don't think the scoring system needs to be changed i think if anything if there was possibility, and I've already said, you know, in previous shows, hey, it'd be cool if semifinals could fit into two days just to give it a better chance to be well attended, more people to get there on the weekend. But I think more events is the answer when it comes to finding the fittest. Um, and that's why I think the games is so wonderful, you know, 12, 13, 14, sometimes, you know, sometimes more events, I think historically. So the six events at semifinals is enough to find very, very fit athletes. I think by and large, the fittest make it, but I do think more events would be better and it would help us get away from these arguments here. I think there are some issues with Z-score. I don't know a ton about it, but I do think one of the challenges for Z-score is that you need a large um, cohort of athletes to make the distribution of the Z-score work correctly. I could be totally wrong at that. I'm happy to argue in comments all day um, about it, but I do think that is one challenge in fitting Z-score to CrossFit. So those are my thoughts. Pretty straightforward. I wanted both of those athletes to make it, but they didn't. So, how many events would you like to see at semifinals if you could choose, James? Nine. Nine. I don't know. I think seven. I think seven from the previous year was was really nice, but I, I think more than six. Okay, four, also, four points I, for James. Go ahead, Tim. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say I. I agree with James, like more events could definitely solve some problems, you know, because then 
I, I agree completely, but I also just like when I saw the schedule for semifinals this year, I was really confused. Like, why are we only doing one event on Friday, two on Saturday, three on Sunday when we only have a six event structure? Basically, and like I did the math, it's like something like 70% of your fitness time for the whole weekend had occurred by Saturday night, but you were only halfway done the weekend because we had all of these shorter events coming in on Sunday that were really high execution with 300 points on the line. Like the margins on the handstand walk workout were next to nothing. The margins on the snatch event, same thing. One missed lift, see you later. And then on the final event, one no rep on a muscle up or one missed up on a lunge, you're gone. So it's like, I guess it kind of fits maybe the Boz era of programming where high execution is very important, but it just seemed weird to me that we had 300 points on Sunday, 30% of the fitness time for the weekend on Sunday, and then Thursday, like you know, Friday, we just had one long event and that was it. So I thought the structure of this year was a little weird. And like we could have done another event on Friday. You know, like I feel like it was just it didn't really make sense to me to go one, two, three events over the course of Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I would assume that they only had one event on Friday for the individuals since there was only the appetizer of the podcast. If I had to guess. Maybe. Very likely. But I mean, hey, Torian had a drone flying out with their athletes in their live coverage for Friday. That the Torian event one coverage was awesome. Like it was it was top notch. They had drones flying around after the athletes. It was very easy to follow. Like and yeah, it was no, they did a great job on event one. So I mean, yeah, I don't I don't know. But yeah, they did a they did a great job and they probably could have put some more fitness out there. Let's go on to KJ. What are your thoughts here? More than 100 points, Z scoring. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm so confident I'm about to win anyways. I'm going to save <laughs> my actual um, getting onto my high horse for after you give me the points. Um, but <laughs> We still have a bonus round, KJ. Oh, I'm not worried. Okay. Unequivocally, no. They should not get more points. As the great Vin Diesel once said, it doesn't matter if you win by an inch or a mile. Winning is winning. You got to fight the people who are you next to. And in the same way, you should get way less points than if you get last. Um, our team collected minutes of time in workouts, and that equated to four points. Beat who's next to you. That's just what you got to do. And the reason I feel this way, and both of these guys are so close to being right, and between them, they had the absolute right answer for this question, which is, we do need to keep the scoring because James was on to something here. It's too complicated to do Z scoring. I know it's better, but the problem with our sport is we put people on a machine to start this workout. Or we started it by sending all of our athletes outside of our venue for four and a half minutes to run away from the camera. And to Tim's point, we had a drone in one country to watch people run. Uh, we put them on machines and have them sit still. This is not a spectacle. This does not grow our sport. If you put a scoring system where you do not know who is winning or by how much during the course of the event, it completely undermines your ability to cheer for somebody because you have no clue what is going on. Nothing is less fun than sitting around being like, well, that person beat that person, but we don't know if they won and buy enough. We're going to wait for a bunch of people to do math in the back room. And an hour later, we're going to know who's actually in first or second place. While it might be a better system in terms of actually determining if that person is fitter than somebody else, it is a brutal way in order to watch a competition because, frankly, you just don't know who is where. So our scoring system, you may want to change the differentiation between the table a little bit. I don't really care. Ultimately, we are rewarding consistency because we are across broad times and modal domains, and we have to be good at everything. I love it when you win. Great. Don't be bad at something else. Um, that's just how it has to be. And at the end of the day, we have to create races. And if you create races that are complicated and you don't know what's happening while it's live, and you certainly don't know what is happening until it's over, the one time it's exciting is when we're tallying up the points at the very end of the competition. Not great if it's at the end of every heat and at the end of every heat heat and at the end of every event. And then we don't know who's winning until three days later because of any of these other things. We have to create races. We have to create programming that gives us races that we are clear and obvious who's where and where they're at and 100 points is 100 points oh man <laughs> i'm gonna give you 
three points just to just to keep you in keep contention with everybody to keep it interesting before we go to the last round. Sean was backstage clapping your whole time because just on, wait, I got a, I got another quick. one that I I didn't, I didn't bring the the real point that I want to bring to this conversation yet. They're still Sean, they're still the hammer. How much of a nightmare is it? And I know from this past weekend calling the broadcast when you're trying to do math, I will raise both hands. I didn't do any math. I had Barkley giving me sticky notes on the math, but adding more math sounds like a nightmare. Well, Kenny's hundred percent right. Z scoring. If you want to use Z scoring, use it for a ranking system, use it for your worldwide ranking, use it for points for that, because now you have time to kind of figure it out. It is a nightmare for a live competition. You know, do it in the open, do it in quarterfinals because we don't know who's winning anyways. Yep. It has, it has its uses, but I don't think live competition is, is one of them. Pete has seven unicorns. stars. Go ahead, Tim. I'm gonna say I'm gonna give the James Hobart answer. Yes. I feel like we're we're forgetting about the power of AI. In the next year, <laughs> I guarantee you, you could have a supercomputer running live Z scoring while an event is happening based off of where people are in the field. It Tim, you could, but we also don't have a camera to watch our athletes, so I don't think we're getting AI to cross it anytime soon. Oh no! I mean, I'm just saying that the potential would be there. Is it going to happen? Yeah. Ninety-nine to one, no. But the maybe. option is there, but the cost might not make it happen. Yeah. James, did you have something? Well, I just—I yeah, mean, nothing but, to contribute. I want to let Tim finish his point, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh no, I'll, I was just going to say we we need goal line scoring first. Like we need like you know soccer has implemented goal line scoring. I mean, there are many ways to better. Like this is a totally different. What's goal line like, clean up scoring? The uh, just in the sense of like athletes being able to peel on a very costly no rep, things like that in competition. Like if we have a, a scoring system that allows like, yes, it's like even like baseball, other sports, like they're starting to implement technology to improve the review process uh, to like, you know, improve calls that made in the heat of the moment. I think CrossFit at some point needs to head in that direction as well with limitations, obviously. But I do think that like there are instances where, you look and you're just like anybody with eyes can look at that and see the judge made a bad call, but it's not being overturned purely on principle. And it's like, because like, we don't, you know, it's like, so I think like, again, using technology, using video review and allowing that professional review, like on CrossFit standpoint, not necessarily like, you know, Joe Schmo in the stands with his camera, you know, his potato zoomed in 17 times, but like, (laughs) you know, professional like cameras to review movement calls made on the floor, I think could go a long way. Cause again, we've all seen the, you know, you could just see, like, again, judges are human. And this isn't a knock on judges. It's just that, you know, humans make mistakes. And, that, you know, that's all That's all it is. Before we have AI. <laughs> Any more thoughts before we go into the bonus round? I just want to say, like, this is an interesting factor. Is like Colton did phenomenal this weekend. I think he, more than anything, blew people out of the water in event one, which is a lot of running. Obviously, got a barbell in it. But, like, I would, I, as soon as he finished that, I'd go, oh, he just punched his ticket. And obviously that didn't end up being the case, but like people should still be fearing this kid. He is getting better every year. And the last two seasons, semifinals have been big, heavy athlete dominant. And that seems to be, I think, the trend for the last two years. And the programming has lent towards people who can create some big horsepower in those capacities. And he started out, I think, a little bit in a the disadvantage there. Um, but he's covered so many of those holes uh, that maybe we perceive from just the, his stature, like incredible athlete um, deserves probably to be at the big show, but the format and how we have created this system is going to preclude him this year. I don't think he's any farther done than we said, Justin might've been like, look out for him. Let's now move on to our ding, 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 ding bonus round. Your biggest winner or your biggest moment of the weekend. You can only pick one. And because Tim and James are tied, I'm going to let Sean pick which one of them gets to go first. Um, I have a question, a proposition. I would like to sacrifice all of my points. If I can just go down a little, a little feel good rundown list. There was, okay, we'll let James do that. Make James big. Decided. He gets no points, yes. and 
just give us a rundown. I'm I'll pretty sure James is Canadian. Too. He's the most like socialist I've met in, the, in this sport. <laughs> oh boy. Um, what if know, James I mean, takes I... all the good ones? Well, I, there's a couple. I, I no, don't know. no, no, no. I this might. is he I gets might. no points. He no gets points. no points. And I'm just going to list yeah. this because I know probably okay. people want to talk about Colton Snatch, and I'm not going to talk about that. But I do just want to go down a list of just cool things I saw. Um, first was just Jay Crouch and Colton on event two, finishing that workout in 10 to 11 minutes, which in my head looking at it, I did not think was possible. So I saw Jay Crouch do it first out of Oceana and then Colton do it in the West. Amazing. Some team stuff. CrossFit Wadex out of Mexico representing a handful of South America, Latin America countries on their roster with an event win in the final event to qualify to the game. Super cool. Um, personal shout out to Coda CrossFit down the road for me. Um, 12th place finish. I don't understand how everyone in their gym is so fit, but they are. Kenny, I mean, I hate this because I have a preference for mayhem, um, but I have to give a huge nod to Invictus. Just their dominance over the years in the team side of the sport is amazing. Um, on the Invictus and Conquerable team, Hannah Black, lifting 245 in that deadlift clean no dead clean front squat jerk complex um pretty much lifts anything she wants and also very well rounded and i also think and you can correct me kenny on this one i'm pretty sure from the invictus team that won in event four did jesse smith do 90 overhead squats unbroken because that's what it <laughs> felt like no offense to anyone else on their team because all those guys and gals are super fit but that was like something like I kept replaying because it seemed to me like she did all those overhead squats unbroken, which blew my mind. Um, individual stuff, real quick hits. Grace Walton, um, missing the games by the last two years, but then getting better and better every year. Winning semis this year, coming very close to winning the Open in rarefied air. Excited to see what she does. Just James Sprague in general, super fit. Yep. Danny Spiegel back at the games. Lots of critics on her side, but still very fit. Olivia Kurtzetter snatches whatever she wants. Two event wins. Tudor Magnet made the last event look as though he didn't even have weight in his hand, which was, you know, finished that obnoxiously fast. Last three things just feel good. Sam Dancer falling backwards and rolling um, backwards oh, yeah. after he failed a snatch that he easily made years prior, but just all smiles. Just cool to see. Um, Cool to see that in the sport. Similarly, Alethea Boone, 40 years old, down in Oceana, finishing top 15. Incredible athlete. So there. That's all I wanted to say. I needed to get all that out. Boom. Some really good memories, but no points for you because the rule is just one. <laughs> uh, Kenny, it's okay. um, quick before we move to Tim next, Jesse did almost all of them. Just in case, squats. just in case Noah is listening, she did all ninety. <laughs> it was, it was, it was the most. I, I was like, "What the hell is going on?" I was asking my wife. I was like, is she, "Has she stopped overhead squatting the entire event?" It was incredible. Okay, Tim, you're up. One moment, biggest winner or moment. All right. My feel good moment is going to go to Scott Tetlow in the snatch ladder mm. out in the West coast. Um, you know, small dude, I've known him for a little while now. He's been close a couple of years at semifinals, regionals, whatever. Um, and you know, he just PR to snatch twice at the end of the ladder. And, you know, it just gives you that like really good feels. It's probably his last semifinal saying he might be bowing out after this year from the competition side of things and just like to kind of be in front of the crowd, know that he's up against a bar he's never snatched before and to be able to hit it twice under fatigue, you know, to get the job done. I just, you know, I think that's super cool. And, you know, you don't, you don't see that too often as much in the sport. I feel like now, like, especially in those ladder style events, um, you know, so it definitely gave some Josh Bridges vibes from back in 2016 with the same event. So yeah, that would be my, that'd be my biggest winner of the weekend just from like, Oh man, that, that, that makes me feel good. That, that was enjoyable to watch. Four points for Tim. Oh, I'm in trouble. All right. KJ, you thought you locked it in, but you might have I to work for it. But <laughs> I, I still think I feel pretty confident here because if there's ever been proof that we're living in a simulation and this is all fake, for the maybe, I'm going to go conservatively fifth time, Cole Sager comes out of absolute destitution in the very last event by fractions of seconds to claim 100% of the time qualifying to go to the CrossFit Games since these in these situations. There's no way you can be on the outside looking in having to do exactly what you need to do 
with razor thin margins of the last two years, especially with all of the events and all of the competitors coming down to milliseconds. And after watching what Tudor did before to leapfrog everybody and win that event outright, to still do just enough somehow with all of that chaos to punch his ticket to his 11th CrossFit Games. One, he's just the second nicest guy in CrossFit. If Noah's the number one, he's definitely fighting for that spot with him every single year. And just a character beyond belief and a fighter that has always shown up in the biggest moments to get his way in there, despite looking on the outside in year after year. Uh, and just genuinely, I know how much it means to him to go back one more time. So that, that for me was just like, what a huge cap off to the weekend to see him despite other people. There's always heartache. There's always people who are celebrating to watch him figure out how to do this a hundred percent of the time, 10 out of 10 times where he just has no reason to be able to make it in there and finding a way. 11 straight him and BKG, the only two guys to do it. Uh, you get four points. You're going to win, but James wants to chime in. His hand is in the air. Go ahead. So I think this raises a question. We talk about programming and scoring and really impressive by Cole for sure. Um, but if we have three, four out of the six events are less than 10 minutes. Um, when we talk about programming and I, and, and from a spectator standpoint, I don't want to watch any more than one 20 minute event, sure. but I, I just wonder when we talk about adding more events to semifinals, if the test would be more well-rounded, if we had at least one other long event in there, I get it. The final is a sprint. Like that's, we've, we've, we've landed on that recipe for semifinals and regionals and it's fun, but I don't know. I just wonder if uh, we're painting the right picture there. So mm. that's it. Any other thoughts on that? Well, you don't have to convince me that the programming needs work. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. I mean, I would agree. There's a lot of, I mean, if you just look at the weekend as a whole, and we don't need to turn this into a Chase Ingram get with the programming episode, but <laughs> I do think that outside of the running event in event one, you know, there was, I would call it significant power output bias throughout the entire weekend. Um, you know, especially for the men, you look at the legless rope climb event. Can you jump high? Can you bike fast? And can you jump really fast? Power output, snatch ladder, duh, final event, power, duh, heavy dumbbells, echo bike, like the rowing workout, the handstands, yes, you had to be fast on your hands, but could you row faster than everybody else, duh. So mm -hmm. there was definitely a recurring theme of power and for the most part length, honestly, being pretty dominant for at least the individual programming. I, I love the team programming this year. I didn't nerd out on it as much, but like I think for the individuals anyway, there was definitely a big power bias and a less – less aerobic um yeah just less aerobic demands okay <laughs> we'll leave it at that kj you are the champion on this week's episode of death by 30 seconds topic of your choosing you may begin okay i'm gonna shout out tim because he actually had the answer to our first question to the 100 points we just need to get rid of regional bias period Every sport that has divisions based on location, and that's how you get to the biggest event, makes no sense. We need to bring back sanctionals. We need to get it out from underneath the thumb of somebody who is not that interested in promoting the sport, hence the maybe lack of folks that showed up to some of these events. Give it back to the people who want to run it, run it to the community, and then let Colton go to two or three of these and earn his way to the CrossFit Games by being on the stage multiple times a year where the programming can be varied and you can get the right people there and you can give our athletes more than one opportunity to qualify for the biggest test. We can all come together and celebrate that in the biggest way possible. Let's get rid of anything that has to do with where you live, having any relative factor of whether you're the fittest on earth or not. It doesn't matter. Thank you, KJ, for your podium pedestal. And thank you, Tim, James, KJ, everybody at home for watching and tuning in for another episode of Death By. Thank you to our sponsor, Thirdsy. Congratulations to Invictus, all the other teams that qualified. Um, we have one more week of semifinals to go. We're going to try to stay awake. We're going to try to survive. And we will see you next week when everything is said and done and we know all of the athletes going to the CrossFit Games.